Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is part of the rhythm of life that we mark significant dates on the calendar. Often these are dates like birthdays that we celebrate or perhaps anniversaries. Typically they're dates filled with joy and celebration. And sometimes there are dates that we set aside to remember and recall loved ones or events that perhaps even change the course of our life. Well, Monday, October 7th, marks the anniversary of the Hamas attack on Israel. One year ago, and the world changed. The world changed especially for those in the midst of this conflict. And if you've been paying attention to the news, almost daily there are reports of this conflict escalating over time and getting to the point that we're at a year later where there could be more of a, a widespread Middle East conflict. And there is fear and concern. It is a place that we as people of faith hold dear to our hearts, but a place that has been always in some semblance of conflict. But the destruction and loss of so many lives, so many innocent people as well, caught in the crossfire is staggering. Monday, October 7th, also marks the one-year anniversary of a loss felt closer to home. Davin Tukwa, a 16-year-old member of our community and our congregation, died tragically in a car accident. A member here, his funeral was held here just about a year ago. If you were around during that time, you remember the shock waves that went through among his friends at Century High School, as well as his family and relation in our congregation. When suffering comes, suffering that is unexpected, unexplained, unearned, unjust, why we ask that question, why? In fact, we know suffering is a part of life, and yet we struggle, especially when suffering seems to occur with the lives of the innocent or the lives of the righteous. Enter into this the story of Job, our Old Testament reading for today. The book of Job in the Old Testament deals primarily with this question of suffering, but specifically the suffering of the righteous, the suffering of those who do not seem to deserve the kind of pain or the weight and sorrow they carry. Rabbi Harold Kushner has written a book that you likely have heard the title of, if not read, and it is simply, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And this is the question of the book of Job. Why do the righteous suffer? Well, perhaps, as we look at the book of Job, it's best to put it in its context in the biblical witness. Job is among a group of books that are called wisdom literature or poetry. Grouped together in the Old Testament, this includes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Now, some of these books get occasional airtime in our worship, but especially the book of Psalms. It is most every week in worship when we recite, or at least listen to, one of the Psalms. Psalms holds the whole uh, gamut of experiences of our human condition, from lament to praise, from lifting up the creative work of God to the very very personal nature of our God. And Psalm 8 is no exception today. Here we lift up the majesty of our God who is the creator whose very fingers can place the stars and the heavens and hang the moon and the sun. And at the same time, we have a God who is this vast and yet this personal who is mindful of humans. In fact, making them a little bit lower than the angels. This God of the vastness of the universe and all that works in creation is just as concerned about you and me. And that mindfulness lifts up the compassionate nature of God, who the psalmist says cares for us. Enter into this the book of Job, 
alongside of Psalms, lifting up a very real human experience of suffering. But in this story of a man who is righteous and upright in God's eyes, we see a compassionate God, but also a God who is working in conversation with Satan. Now, we are very aware of Satan, especially in the New Testament. When we talk about Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness, we name Satan. Job also lifts up that name and the power that Satan wields. Evil at work, that which is somewhat under control and somewhat loosed by Satan without much for boundaries. Apparently, Satan has been working a bit on Job prior to this because there is reference to a conversation of the past. But now, Satan has an idea that this righteous one, pushed to the very limits, will eventually cave in and not be so faithful to God's promises. And God says, do what you do, but do not take Satan's life, or excuse me, do not take Job's life. Well, I encourage you to read the whole book of Job. It's not that long, but you will learn all of the calamity that comes to Job in his lifetime. He loses his children, seven of them crushed when their house uh, falls upon them. And he loses his livelihood. Everything he has earned, everything he has worked hard to establish is gone. And then add to it his health. We got a glimpse of that in these opening words from Job today. Perhaps they were a little bit irritating to hear, the fact that he had sores and scabs on his skin and was using pottery to scratch them. He was miserable. Loss upon loss upon loss. How will Job stand up to this kind of testing? How will Job respond? Will he be faithful? Who can bear so much? Well, this past week has been filled with images of destruction and loss. Like you, I have been captured by images from Hurricane Helene and horrified with the immense loss and damage that has been done in many communities on the coast. I have especially been tuned in to what's happening in Asheville, North Carolina, because about 10 years ago, a group of friends and I traveled to Asheville, and we enjoyed time in the community and in the beautiful region of North Carolina. Now to see pictures of that area, it is unrecognizable. And then to hear stories of those who have lost their livelihood, who have lost their family members in just a moment's time who have literally lost everything and now even struggle for their own health and wellness, looking for clean water in places that are safe for them to reside. We may wonder, how will these people ever rebuild their lives? How will this kind of trauma continue to affect this community? What more can anyone take? Well, in the story of Job, there are friends who surround him in his difficult time, but these friends offer platitudes, and they want Job to just get over it. They're not particularly helpful, unless in the time when they simply sit with him in his sorrow. But they offer suggestions, and even his own wife, who we heard in this opening reading, says, get over it, Job. Just blame God and move on. But Job gives this important word. He says, we take the good days from God. Why not also take the bad days? In other words, we are more than happy to praise God when blessings seem to abound, but when troubles come, <laughs> why sometimes we just want to point the finger at God and say, why would you do this to me, God? We take the good days with the bad days. And this is the wisdom of the book of Job. For Job understands a promise, a promise that God would preserve his life, would be with him no matter the calamity he faced, no matter the wielding of Satan and the evil powers at work around him. God made a promise to hold his life, and God made good on that promise. In the end, Satan does not win. God prevails. 
in the end, Job is faithful. It doesn't mean that Job does not lament. Job laments in this book in the Bible. But Job, at the same time, clings to the promise of his redeeming God. Many theologians have wrestled with this book for centuries. Many theologians have had great thoughts that help us to understand more fully. One quote from a theologian I appreciate, Frederick Beekner, says, Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. Another well-known theologian who knew evil firsthand living in Nazi Germany as a Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, God wants to always be with us wherever we may be in our sin, in our suffering, and in our death. We are no longer alone. God is with us. We are no longer homeless a bit of the eternal home itself has moved into us. Of course, Beekner and Bonhoeffer are speaking to the home God makes for us in Christ. Of course, the promise we hold to is that our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, has come to defeat the power of Satan and evil and death forever. And that is the promise that gives us hope. This promise that we hold on to is one we, of course, uh, proclaim with gladness on an Easter Sunday morning. It is the center of our faith. But did you know that one of those Easter hymns that we sing with our whole heart actually is a quote from the book of Job? In Job chapter 19, Job is lamenting, but in the midst of his lament, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And this confession of faith, long before Christ will appear on the earth, is centered in the promise that God has made to him, a promise to be his redeemer. And in fact, the fullness of Job's words are worth hearing again in this chapter. Job says, for I know that my redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand on the earth and I will see him with my own eyes beside me and no other. Oh, how my heart faints within me. Do you hear the poetry, but also the profession? The power there is in a promise, a promise for you and for me, in the midst of whatever suffering may come in this life. Monday will be a difficult day, for people in our world as they continue to grieve loss in the midst of war ravaged in the Middle East. And Monday will be a difficult day for Davin Tukwa's family. In the midst of suffering, unexplainable, still leaving us with questions, there really are no easy answers, but there is always a promise and always hope. A year before Davin Tukwa died in that tragic accident, he affirmed his baptismal promises here in this sanctuary. As with every confirmation student, he, among his uh, friends, chose a confirmation verse. These were the words that gave Davin Tukwa a promise. He did not know what the future would bring, but he knew who held that future. Will you read these words from Romans with me? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May these words grant you comfort and peace in the midst of this day, whatever it is that you are facing, whatever may be of suffering to you in this time or in the suffering of another. May you know that God is with you in the hard times, but also in the good. Amen.